In this video, I'm gonna show you how to design your very first custom microcontroller board using the free open source software KiCad. Okay, let's get started. So I've got my KiCad software opened up and the first thing is I'm going to open up the schematic editor and I'm gonna start placing components and the first one is gonna be the microcontroller itself. I'm gonna go with the STM32F042 and we're gonna go with the TSSO P20 pin package. It comes in higher pin packages if you want more GPIO pins, but to keep it simple, I'm gonna go with the, just the 20 pin package. And this microcontroller, the STM32F042, is one of my favorite microcontrollers, especially for beginners, partially due to the fact that you can program it entirely over the USB interface, so you don't need any special expensive hardware. In fact, this microcontroller supports the official USB DFU protocol, which is device firmware upgrade, allowing you to program it over the USB interface. And then secondly is the problem with USB is typically it requires an external crystal because you need very precise timing for USB. But the STM32 F042 happens to support crystalless USB, meaning that it has an internal oscillator that's been factory trimmed to be accurate enough to use for USB. So this greatly simplifies programming this microcontroller versus a lot of other options. And now I'm gonna just start placing a few of my passive components. I'm gonna do a resistor. Now I'm gonna place the symbol for a capacitor. Now I'm gonna just set the footprints and I'm gonna go with the 0805 footprint for all of the passives. It's kind of a big package, but it's a nice size if you're not space limited and especially if you're gonna do the hand soldering yourself. So let me add the footprint also for the capacitor. Once again, it's an 0805. Same package designator number, the 0805 is for resistors and capacitors. And now that I've created those, I'll just copy these and use them wherever I need to. Let's connect up the ground. So all I'm doing here is setting up the boot pin and the reset pin. So the NRST is a negative reset. So whenever it goes low, it will reset the part. So I'm putting a capacitor on there and a pull-up resistor. So what happens is initially when you power on the part, this capacitor is like a short because an uncharged capacitor is equivalent to a DC short. So that basically momentarily holds the reset low. This pull-up resistor eventually pulls it high and then that allows it to automatically power up. And I'm also gonna put a switch in here so we can force it to go low to do a reset. Now I'm just placing the decoupling capacitor. And then this R1 here in a moment is gonna be for the boot pin. And that just is gonna determine what the boot mode is. And I'll explain that more in a bit. Let's just rotate this around. I changed it to one microfarad. And normally, ideally, you would, for decoupling capacitors, you would have a a bigger cap and then also a really small cap, so like a microfarad, and then maybe a 0.1. I'm gonna keep this as absolutely simple as possible. So I'm just gonna do the one microfarad cap on the input for the decoupling cap. I've got the boot switch here for the boot pin. So by default, this will hold the boot pin low, but I can force it high so I can program it. Got the switch here to pull down for the reset. Okay, so we've got our boot and we have our reset. Now in this video, we're keeping things really simple, but if you wanna see how to expand this design by adding a bunch of extra features, then you can find the link to this expanded design in the description below, which includes both the expanded tutorial video and the design files. Now I'm just drawing the two data lines for the USB port, and you can find these on the data sheet, what pins they're on. So this is the USB DM, which is the, the negative one. And then we've got the, the positive. It's a differential pair, which will be critical when we go to route that. Okay, I've got the two USB data lines. Now I'm going to add the USB connector. We're gonna go with the USB-C connector, which allows you, as you well know, to put the plug in either orientation. Okay, let's connect up the shield and the ground. Just mirrored this around so the pins are facing the microcontroller. Just makes the routing a little easier. 
So we need the V bus, which is going to be the five volt supply coming through the USB, which is what we're using to power this. I'm going to throw a one microfarad decoupling cap on that as well. So that's going to be our five volt supply. Now, the other thing we need is there's a CC1 and a CC2, and those need to have a 5.1 kilo ohm resistor on both of those tied to ground. This is something you don't do on a normal, like an old USB micro plug. This is only USB C. So, as soon as you see the CC1, CC2, you know it's a USB C connector. Now let me get these out of the way here, make a little room. Okay, now we're going to connect up the data lines. And you'll see there are two data lines, or there's two D minuses and two D plus. And that's just because of the, the, the nature of the, of the USB C. So you can flip it and plug it in either way. So the orientation changes. So there needs to be two of each so that you get one of them in each of the two orientations. So I'm just going to short the two D minuses together, the two D pluses together. And then those are going to connect back into the microcontroller USB lines that we already drew. I'm going to actually increase this to 10 microfarad. Give us a little better transient performance. So there are two ways to do schematics. You can physically draw the wires like the USB data lines. I could have connected them, or you can just use labels and then that automatically connects them. I tend to use a mix of both. Now we just need a regulator because the five volts coming off the USB cannot power the US or the STM32. So we're going to need a, a linear regulator to step that voltage down. So we're going to step it down from five volts to 3.3. And typically, if your input and output are pretty close, you know, within a couple of volts and you don't have amps of current, then typically a linear regulator, an LDO, is going to be your, your simplest, cheapest, best option. It's only when you have high input-output differences or really high currents, or if you need an output voltage higher than the input voltage, then you need to switch into, well, no pun intended, you need to switch to switching regulators. Okay, we've got our input, our output cap. Just do one microfarad. This PG is just power good. I'm not going to use that. It's just an open drain output. So you can know if the output supply has reached the, the, the regulated uh, threshold. I'm going to tie the input to 5 volt, the USB coming off of our USB C plug. And then this here um, is going to be our 3V3, so 3.3 3 volt. Commonly, just 3V3 is how you'll see that labeled sometimes instead of a decimal point. Okay, so we've got our linear regulator. Let's make sure that's connected. Yes, you can see the 3.3, 3V3 is highlighted. That's what's going to the microcontroller. Same with the 5 volt line. You can see it comes out of the USB and makes it to the LDO input. Now we just need it to do something. Microcontroller that doesn't do anything is not really that useful. But first, I'm going to just add a LED that allows us to tell that it's powered on. But here in a moment, I'll, I'll add a separate LED that we can control through the microcontroller so we can actually tell that it's doing something. But while I'm doing LED, or LEDs, let me go ahead and just get this input or the one for the supply. Really simple. If the linear regulator is functioning and you get 3.3 volt out, that's going to turn on this LED. And R5 just sets the current through that LED. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this over the LED and the current limiting resistor. And this is what we're going to connect up to a GPIO pin on the microcontroller so that we can basically flash this LED any way that we want to in the programming. But I'm also going to use an NMOS FAT here. This isn't absolutely required. You could drive this LED directly from the GPIO pin of the microcontroller, you just need to make sure that the maximum current that the GPIO pin can sync or source is, is more than what you need to drive the LED. But if you're, you can play it safe, or if you need to drive more current, then that's when you use a switch. So this NFAT on the bottom here, NMOS is a switch that whenever the gate is high, it allows this LED to come on. So this gate's going to be just connected to the microcontroller GPIO, and there's no current flow here. This gate has an oxide, so there's no current flow, so it doesn't load the microcontroller like it would if you were to connect this directly without using the switch. Need a supply, of course. 
And you could do this to the 3.3, but I'm gonna do it to the five. Why? Why add extra load to our LDO? And now we just need the GPIO pin on the microcontroller that's gonna to connect to the gate of the NFAT turning on the LED. Okay, let's just make sure they're connected. Yep, they both highlight in the pink color, meaning they are schematically connected. So in this video, I've kept things really simple, but if you wanna see how you can expand this design by adding a bunch of extra features, including flash memory, a color display, a battery charger, an accelerometer, a motor controller, an IO expander, and a lot more, then you can find the link to this expanded design in the description below which includes an expanded tutorial video and the design files. So if you found this video helpful, then you're gonna to wanna to watch the next video that I'll be publishing in a week where I'm gonna design the PCB layout for this same design. And it should be published by the time you watch this video.